know now what I want to say in my intro for my podcast. I'm going to start with a warning to other creatives. Create like it's your last podcast, last graphic, last painting, last blog post. There's so many forces out there that want us to be bland, and that is not possible with this fro. I have too many thoughts about celebrating us, reading what I want to read, pointing out donkeys, what links us together and shouldn't tear us apart. I also give you bonus content through 10 Fro's Bar on my Patreon and if you become a melanated nerd. I also will share content about getting the real tea on reality TV. Join me in this episode of Tim Fro is reading for the wild ride. And thank you for listening. So I am sitting here in a, just a chilling out Saturday and just like I thought it's been kind of raining on and off. It's been cloudy on and off all weekend, but that doesn't matter because my glow up is for real. I've had, it has been an exponential growth in the last 30 days where I am well on my way within the next maybe 30 to 45 days being over 300,000 downloads. I am still hopeful for the day where each episode of my show garners that many downloads per show i think on a realistic kind of on a realistic kind of uh satisfaction that in itself would make me think and be very grateful to every one of my listeners um and people that actually think that my show is just that i'm noticing exponential growth as far as impressions as far as when you listen to the show you see a variety of uh, advertisements that are being inserted i'm just ecstatic or happy that not only the listeners get to listen to some of these great funny advertisements but the advertisers themselves think my show warrants them placing the advertisements within the show so the show itself will actually pay for itself and this is like from a person that the show is growing organically that people come back to listen to each episode because they're getting something from it i have people that are still leaving amazing uh reviews as far as insights and stories wisdom um a journey of self-discovery the contradiction empowerment at its finest you know i hope that these same people will come back and listen to further episodes because i plan on discussing why african americans flipped from lincoln's party um to uh the democrats because it had been for a very long time that the democratic party especially in the south was all about itself but when roosevelt and the new deal and the depression basically had this country at its grips fdr came through with a plan that would not only help other whites but also help us when we were at the lowest of the low we were already starving we were already in um the depths of poverty but his new deal would go on to benefit everyone no matter what color they were and you can't have jim crow you can't be a complete racist and have that particular type of legislature that could help everyone no matter what the issue was 
Herbert Hoover and the rest of the uh, tried and true Republicans couldn't figure that out, couldn't figure out how to help only their people. But this new style Democrat from the North, uh, who was actually related to te the Teddy Roosevelt, came through and rescued the country, had plans to rescue the country from the rest, the, the worst economic disaster um, since basically the Civil War. So I basically delve deeper into that in the next segment. But I'm grateful for the people that basically saw my insight and my take on Not Honest Abe. Um, and it basically encouraged me to basically look for other people or other uh, U.S. leaders that African Americans idolize and having a different take on it. And I can basically afford to do that because this is my show and nobody's paying me to basically say what I say and mean what I say. So there you go. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading tin for Even though I'm really annoying. <laughs> Dog just tried to jump and jump back off like she's a big old scaredy cat. However, anyways, even though I'm really annoyed with the status of Royal Housewives of Atlanta, and I've all completely and continually threatening to stop watching season 15 and just wait for the reunion. I am still invested in the franchise itself. Um, so much so that I've, I'm always re-watching previous seasons. And I'm re-watching the season. This is like season nine, which was the pivotal season. This is even more so than the season where Portia dragged Kenya, we because we continually talk about what if it if you need to reboot the show, who should be on the show, and I keep hearing that it doesn't make sense. The 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 dream season holders, even Nene, I think mentioned Portia, um, excuse me, Phaedra Parks, Fake and Phaedra should come back, and I can't say that I want her fake butt to come back for many reasons. And here's why. Number one, I did not know who Angela Stanton was until I had re started rewatching the season and I had mentioned, especially this episode where they say, would you be have been okay with uh, bringing that lady that wrote that book on the, the show um, and have an episode where you talk about her. But, and then I had to go back to figure out, number one, who she was, what was that book? And then when I did the research on Amazon, I realized that not only had she written Lies of a Real Housewife, uh, Tell the Truth, Shame the Devil, she actually wrote a follow-up book, Dismissed with Prejudice, because I remember distinctly them talking about that the original book on this particular season and then coming back. And then I say, well, I'm not going to read the original book because I want to know Dismissed with Prejudice, what does that mean? 
Girl, she spilled all the tea. And I wish they had basically brought her on the show to help not only Apollo, but Candy, you know, defend themselves against Fake and Phaedra. Phony Fake Fake. And I'm going to have to put this on extended podcast notes because I was not shocked, but she actually had the receipts. If y'all actually read Dismissed with Prejudice, the majority of the book has the quintessential receipts about the back and forth that it, this book or her um, uh, interaction with Phaedra Parks went for about four years. We first heard about her when Apollo got locked up. And then she basically uh, wrote her life story. And then we so through the show, we found out that Phaedra had sued her. Well, that's only part of the story. Evidently, Phaedra not only sued her, but sued Vibe.com or Vibe Magazine for um, uh, showcasing her when her of, about her story and then her publishers about publicate, publishing this book, which supposedly slandered her. No, it didn't. Because I did not know that several things were very astonishing. I think, or if I have the timeline correct, the reason why she actually knows Phaedra was from her interactions with several of Phaedra's acquaintances because she was known not only for representing Bobby Brown, she ep- she represented that dude that threatened to blow her up. Guess who um, Drama's ex-girlfriend was? Angela Stanton. I had no idea that was true. I did not know that she was also the co-defendant on his first, uh, Apollo Nida's first fraud case. Angela Stanton was involved in many of some nefarious uh, dealings which were allegedly associated with phony Fay Fay. But she's the only one and the associates, you know, served time, but phony Fay Fay never did. Because she asked the question, what would make a celebrated attorney marry a felon? It was completely, it, it made sense to me once I realized that if you marry somebody, it's called spous- spousal privilege. Then they can't touch you. Everything that she's basically, allegedly, everything that Phaedra Parks has done from the time she's been on the show to the time marrying and sleeping with Apollo on his air mattress and all of those things was to protect her image. And he kind of alluded to that. Angela Stanton made it clear in her book and in the follow-up, but it was only, she only comes after you when you get, when you go after her image. Apollo got locked up. She basically, and even, what's her name? Ronnie, her divorce lawyer, said, why did you marry him? You knew he was a felon? Yeah, because she was involved with the felon. She had to shut his ass up. It's called spousal privilege. I don't think there's no limits on, uh, you know, when he could actually talk and it could be actually credible because it can be thrown out. That's why she married him, because she was on some gangster fraud shit. And that is why, or what's pussy popping girl in Miami? Shamia basically said, don't leave um, your IDs or credit cards around her because she's so she, because evidently she read the book and she knew what Fei Fei was into, Girl, allegedly into. This is some gangster crap. And Phaedra was still lying because she didn't win the case. She basically, they, they settled out of court. The publishers and Vibe magazine 
settled out of court. But this case, this $30 million uh, libel suit was dismissed with prejudice. Not only could Angela Stanton not refile against her, who never asked for any money, Phony Fefe could not file, refile uh, because it was dismissed. She didn't win the case. It was just dismissed because she did some, you know, super fairless stuff. She didn't show up for depositions. Then she answered crazily. And then when she did finally show up for deposition, it had to be sealed because she basically revealed her own duplicity in what she was actually doing. Evidently, Angela Stanton basically told the truth. She also exposed that the lady's Angela Stanton daughter had gone to social media and her mom had a fight like um, Kurt Franklin had a fight with his son. Posted, you know, some uh, inflammatory text online. Phony Fei Fei took screenshots of those texts and presented it like she got the girl to turn against her own mama. And it took years for them to clear that up. And she said nothing. Just like she did in Maui when they were on this show. And it's so wild that this trial basically came to a crescendo when season nine actually got, was um, dropped. And all that she did presented herself as uh, Martin Luther Phaedra was a smokescreen for the bullshit and the duplicitous crap that she was doing to Angela Stanton behind the scenes. And she's always allegedly been a fake and a fraud and a liar. And she's allowed people, just like she did on this show, allege that Phaedra, allege that Portia and Candy were going to take the fall for the duplicitous crap that she was doing. And then she was trying to make herself to be this Southern Belle and this crusader for justice. It was all a smokescreen because she was doing some dirty crap behind the scenes. And she used her friends, so-called friends and associates, and this show as a smoke screen to cover up the phoniness and illegal activities. And I find it amazing. And I'm wondering why Bravo never tapped into it because I probably, they, she wouldn't have allowed any of this uh, to come to fruition. But if they could go back, I don't think, because I think maybe Candy sued her. And that lie could have ended Candy Burris's brand and her, uh, she, it would have just been horrible. But the whole thing that drama, the, when the guy that allegedly came after her, uh, after he, uh, was hooked up in some stuff that she covered up, she was probably a part of that but he served 12 years. Angela Santon served 12 years. Apollo got hit. And it makes sense that everybody was like, Apollo lived in your house and you didn't know what he was doing because she probably uh, introduced him to the connects, but then he was so stupid and got caught up, but she knew that she had nothing to do with it. She probably gave him the name but her name wasn't on anything except for NIDA Entertainment or NIDA uh, uh, Fitness, which remember in the episode uh, when um, Apollo, uh, he, he's, it's like NIDA Fitness, but she went after Candy and um, um, Todd because of that workout video, but her name is the only person that's on um, that particular business entity. She was, I'm sure, except for that, 
and it could have been a way for her to launder money. But the way it was set up, her name wasn't on anything. And she, it was set up that she had so many of her pawns. They call her Pinocchio because so many of her pawns were t would take the fall for her. But Nida divorced her. Angela Stanton wrote this book. And I'm sure the feds would have come after her. And with the 96% um, conviction rate, they would have got her. But she was smart. That's the thing. Brilliant. She's like the Lex Luthor of criminal law in Atlanta. Nothing was in her name that could tie her back to the criminality that we everybody suspect her for. And the only reason why they put her ass up off of Housewives is because of this megawatt lie. And Kenny Burris probably had enough clout to say, we ain't going to stand for it. She used Portia Williams. She used Candy Burris of Escape. And that's what she get. And she had so many people, including her fans, that were willing to take the fall or to take it on. Of course, the mother and, and so-and-so, she's doing all these great things. It was all a smokescreen. Because while she was doing all of this on a national platform, she was dragging this lady's name through the coals for her own benefit. Shame on you, Port. Shame on you, faking Phaedra. Phaedra, shame on you. And you don't deserve a place on um, Bravo Reality TV, although it would be some good watching. But I'm thinking you not being on, back on reality TV because you would only use it for your benefit and we wouldn't get anything real. We already have enough of that and we tired of watching. Why do we need fake and favorite Phaedra on not telling us the truth and still faking? That's dumb. And we don't need that. I'm going to have to disagree with uh, Mimi and anybody else that thinks Phaedra Parks need to come back because she doesn't. We're good. But we still need a better cast because this cast, I don't, I don't like the energy. There is no real connection. And she's one of the OGs that really need to be left off if Angela Stanton book is any indication. She's so nefarious. She is so criminal. We're good. So in this episode of Woke History, <laughs> I am taking a closer look and a deeper dive into the presidency of, this time, FDR. I had the most, they were positive uh, reaction um, to my lying Abe segment that I posted a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's important that we not wholeheartedly and we wholeheartedly follow anyone. The only person that benefited or that should have been followed, uh, but, and, but doesn't need to be followed blindly is like Martin Luther King and most recently Barack Obama. But I also recognize that they were or are men and they have their own, you know, weaknesses and I'm sure they've made mistakes. I'm going to probably in the next couple of weeks, even though it's probably going to be considered sacrilegious, that I bought recently a book about um, the most recent biography of Martin Luther King. But I want to present a side that even with all of flaws and missteps, they still did great things. Um, but 
I want to make sure that this is just my opinion. You know what I mean? But I think it needs to be balanced. You know, I think that we, in order to get to the truth, and the truth is actually more interesting than anything people can made up, and this uh, sainthood kind of fixture um, that we have of some of the greatest leaders of the free world. And it's, and it's pays to be, um, it, it pays to be really um, direct and to be complete. The white free world, you know what I mean? Because that is, because facts are facts. These people have said, they have written, and have done things. For example, in 1929, in our country, we went, it was the beginning of the great, um, the market crash, the stock market crash. And it's not like the market hadn't crashed before. It crashed not too long um, after the end of Civil War and through the economic decline after Grant, who was a complete alcoholic and should not have been allowed um, this is Ulysses S. Grant, should not have been allowed to run our country. We were still recovering uh, in the Reconstruction in the South. The go-go days of the 1920s put the go-go days of after Reagan to shame and right before the economic crash of 2008, we basically fell into the abyss of economic decline. We had people jumping in Wall Street, jumping out of uh, scar skyscraper buildings, committing suicide. We had fortunes wiped out within seconds. And we didn't have the economic and federal breaks that we actually did um, through the most recent crash. It was, we also saw during this time that poor African Americans were destitute and poor and had been for a longer period, long period of time. Um, there's old money that didn't speculate in the crash, and I'm sure there are many families that did lose a grip. But the majority at that time, before the Great Migration, or right at the beginning of the Great Migration, there it was a we were on farms. Uh, generations of families were still in the throes of poverty after the end of Civil War, and then uh, with the sharecropping, which was a, to me it just seems like a different form of of slavery. However, it was during this time that the destitution of other races, in all races at the time. We were, uh, there were soup lines, um, there was high unemployment. A lot of people were doing poorly. And then the great dust bowl of the Midwest. It was a whole, it was a harsh, harsh time. But it was still during this time that African-Americans clung to the belief and participated uh, proudly in the grand old, I call it the grand wizard party of the, of the Republic, um, Abe Lincoln's party. In spite of his obvious racist views, he did free slaves. However, he was all for, I don't think most people knew or they ignored that he did not believe in our equality. He believed that slavery was fundamentally wrong, but he did not re believe in the equality of all men and women, and definitely not black men and women. And also during the time of the basic, the great, beginning of the Great Depression, Hoover did not have an exit plan. He was like most Republicans. You work to the bootstraps, but we are not gonna create any jobs. Um, and the Republican told the line 
of um, economic um, disparity. And there, even though a vast majority of people lost their all of their money, a lot of people still had money and they were mostly white folks. And he was cool with that. He had no plan to basically wretch um, the entirety of the country out of this. So they were still, and it was also, during, I found out explicitly, Mexican Americans were being deported like they're trying to do now. <laughs> and all brown people from South America, they were actually continuing to be deported. Who knew that? Out of the country, get out. And that continued well into the first presidency, term presidency of FDR. But then something happened. A plan to wrest us out of this Great Depression, put people to work rebuilding this country and shoring up our economic base. That is how it was an economic decision because it not only benefited white folks, it benefited everyone, including us. Hoover did not have a plan for this. And then some other actions were necessary to make sure that it was safe for us to be uh, to unionize. We were granted a fair wage. We needed to serve in the military but we couldn't serve in a segregated military. There were so many great things that came out of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, rule. But then there was always a, a, a negative to that, meaning even though we had a fair uh, decrease in discrimination of fair in fair housing, they also had a whites only kind of clause and uh, for the FHA loans um, and that increased redlining. So even though we had, there seemed to be a good thing, there was always a negative about, about it. There was always a different side. There was a, a possibly good uh, goodness to it, but then there was always a negative side. Um, there was a desegregation of the military, but that didn't extend to the neighborhoods or the treatment even within the ranks. It never forced people to actually still be treated fairly within the ranks. And that was always, there was always uh, racism and insidious racism uh, always played a role in our ability in some of the decisions that we would make because although they made these decisions, that benefited us, they weren't specific to us. There was never a decision to fully give us civil rights. That wouldn't happen to an, almost a half a decade, um, half a century later in the 1960s. We had to go through another world war, Vietnam, uh, Korean war, before we would even get to the codification of civil rights in this country. True fair voting acts. Uh, a true fair housing or true fair employment. All these things were there, but nobody, but always people had in their minds, they never wanted to alienate um, another group of white folks in the South. So that's why there was no full force Civil Rights Act until the 1960s, until almost 20 years, so it wasn't a half a century, it was just a quarter. another quarter of a century had to pass before they would actually, Lyndon B. Johnson would be forced to codify. Martin Luther King had to be assassinated. Kennedy had to be assassinated. We had to go through a couple of more wars before basic rights um, afforded to all U.S. citizens wasn't codified. Even after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. We had to go through, and that's where we had to go through a whole, almost a full century before we could see true fruition of those amendments in the Constitution. 
Who knew? We let reconstruction happen. Then they desegmented or dismantled that. We let Jim Crow rule. We let lynch people be lynched. It would take some more years to get anti-lynching laws passed. Still had to go through a whole bunch more lynches to get more uh, passed. And that young guy from Chicago. We would have to get another young man had to be lynched. And we still, you know, low-key having lynches. Emmett Till had to be lynched again. And we had to see it on front of Jet Magazine in our international papers. Even though we had all of these things, had these laws, but everybody ignored. And they wanted it sealed, and they tried these big cover-ups. We had to see uh, Malcolm X be assassinated. We had to see Megger Evers be killed in front of his kids in his house. And it would take another half a century before his murderers would actually be prosecuted. It would take almost a half a century for that bitch that lied on Emmett Till that led to his lynching, she would recant. So I just, it's just a lot of things that we have to look at. Although the New Deal in its inception was a great idea, FDR set out to do many great things with the inception of the New Deal. And it benefited not only white Americans, but us, but the actual fruition he wasn't stupid. He was a complete politician. He knew he had to have the support of everyone, and he would not sacrifice his uh, uh, the pop, his uh, whole presidencies uh, with making sure that everyone uh, in the population was actually treated fairly. We just, it was basically, it was like collateral benefit. When they made the majority of white folks a little bit comfortable and ease their destitution, we just actually benefited from it. But you know who didn't benefit it from it? Mexican Americans. They were excluded from the Fair Housing and also Fair uh, Wage Act. They were continued deported through most of his presidency. And then we had the internment of Japanese Americans. So with those things, there's a, a, a positive, but there's also a negative side to his presidency. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, did many great things, but she was probably undercover gay and stayed with him because presidents and definitely Roosevelt's did not get divorced. But it didn't keep him from cheating on her, but it was basically she would have been villainized did I read? I think I read something of uh, a biography or saw something on Netflix about her life story and how she had to basically, she was basically greater than her husband, but she had to live, uh, she had to dim herself in order to continue to be married to him and to do the work that she wanted to work. Because at that time, uh, plain women but also plain rich women did not do what she wanted to do. But she lived a whole separate, happier life, separate from her husband. And she was more so than the first lady of the United States to look pretty and to not say a whole bunch. But she was a writer um, and she was very involved in the women's movement as well as in civil rights. And she, uh, one of the big great things that she did move Marian Anderson, um, the opera singer, uh, to perform at the Lincoln Center, which I think is apropos because Lincoln would have never have loved that because, again, he was racist. He said during that, before that debate, that he would never want to marry uh, a white black woman, and he did not think of the equality of black people. So. That would have been rich. 
but I guess nerds to him. So I think that's actually ironic that she would move it there, even though he would be one of the activists that would never have agreed to her performing at his uh, memorial. But she, that's her way of thumbing and not bending to the white patriarchy. So good for her. I actually have many kudos for her versus um, her husband, because her husband, he was a politician and he won't crazy. He would go just enough to make sure maximum benefit for his people, but, and my people only got the benefit collaterally, but we could never fully participate in the recovery of the United States until we, the civil rights, and he would not have, and he never pushed full codification for civil rights, never did. Um, it would take, again, as I said, another quarter of a century before we would see that realization in, of all people, Lyndon B. Johnson's presidency. Air and swing till all the white folks scream. Thought y'all could run upon our black king. I'm glad the squad pulled up, dedicated to not give you but. <laughs> Okay, first, y'all crazy, and y'all need to be ashamed of yourself. Why are y'all going to re-edit and remix the National Black Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and the 16-year-old that swam over to assist in the, in the fight, naming him Evan, Evander Holygill? Y'all need to be ashamed of yourself. And why are people advocating for August 5th being the Montgomery Nuck If You Buck Day? Girl, oh, I love our people. I can't. I just cannot. But if you are, again, living under a rock, this is probably the best thing for black unity that I've seen in a very much while. And it's really sad because the dude that was swinging the chair, they did arrest him, I think, in the last 24 hours, or he turned himself in. But the Montgomery brawl was because a black uh, captain of a boat, a steamship, basically asked this crew that white folks known to illegally park their little pontoon boat to get out of the way so he could do his black ass job. They decided to run up on him. It was a wipe me down, throw hat ceremony, and he squared up on him. And then a whole bunch of other people joined in. And the chair, the folded chairs have, they said there was no weapons used. Pure fisticuffs, except for the dude that swung the chair. That shit was funny as hell. And then they actually, and people were commenting on it like it was a WWE kind of uh, fight, you know, it was hysterical. But this was one of those days where we have to get the tugboat captain and everybody participated in the brawl, um, a part of the FAAFF crew to just, you're not going to run up on us, you know? He was just kindly doing their job, telling you what you had been warned of before, and you wanted to live in your white privilege, and y'all got God. That's the funniest. That's the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, and I keep finding funnier things than the remix of the Black Anthem or mix it, lift every voice and sing. But I've all, but y'all have put it to good times. Y'all renaming these people. I think you can be an advocate for nonviolence, and I am to a certain extent. But this is also a time where you just you just go fuck around and find out. Y'all rolled up on the wrong person, and y'all rolled up on it. It's too hot in Montgomery, Alabama. I was down in Montgomery for 
Air Force uh, training when I joined the Air Force right before uh, my officer's training. And it is too damn hot, especially on the same wharf that we built, that we were sold from. That y'all thought y'all were going to roll up on this team or captain to do his job. And nobody, and the thing is, everybody joined in to help protect him. You are not going to roll up on people. And this was the thing where even the Montgomery police were like, thank God for social media and for cell phone footage. Because the real perpetrators that started it, were were arrested and they all billy bob and them were all arrested but it was a knuck if you buck kind of thing they instigated this riot and we didn't start it but we sure are gonna finish it big ups to black unity because this was the funniest thing i've seen in a very long time and as more information comes out or if i find more even more funnier because i think i'm also going to post this on extended podcast notes because this dude is hysterical and now the new black anthem lift every chair and swing boy <laughs> i couldn't even get to the rest of it because i had to laugh very hard as y'all heard me in the beginning of the segment <laughs> he lifted every chair and swing. boy you stupid and further in pop news there's a couple of things that i wanted that i think i i don't think i actually delved into there's been an update on the murder of O'Shea Sibley for a couple of days, and it may have been propagated by the murderer himself, who said, stated that he was a Muslim. That has been fully debunked by his um, defense lawyer. They say he is, and I don't know if he is an exchange student or he is his family. He's originally from Russia. He's been here in this country working two jobs, but he is not a Muslim. He is a Christian kid. Um, And I don't know by breaking one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, if he can still be considered a good Christian or it's just some type of work in progress. But right now, he's a hate crime mongering, uh, knife welding murderer. And I still hope the bras on the yard make him his bitch. That's just my thing. Um, I myself am a good uh, Christian work in progress, but I ha- I give, I'm fresh out of with this kid um, because he did some adult shit and he's going to pay that price. Also, Tory Lane, another f- uh, not, uh, f- I think he's a naturalized citizen, took it upon himself to try to maim. Meg the Stallion, he got 10 years, and I hope at the end of where he has to serve at least 85% of it before he can even be considered for um, parole, I think at the end of that should be deportation. They need to send his butt back to Canada. And I wonder what happens to people that are deported. When they go back to their home country, does that automatically make them uh, felon or something like that, and well, I just wonder what happens. But I'm hoping deportation is at the end of that, and everybody that wrote a letter of support of this would-be murderer or mainster felon, all of y'all need to take many seats. Iggy Exalia as is the biggest one. start the section on pop culture and my opinion on pop culture. And I'm just going to start this with allegedly uh, and ukulele music. Um, Most people have, if you haven't been living under a rock, you've heard about the wildfires in Maui of all places. I worked there uh, for a better part of a year where I would fly back and forth. Um, this is, I had a full-time job in South Carolina. I would hop on the red eye, uh, fly 
first, I think we had a layover. I would have a layover if it depends on which route I took in Dallas. And then I would move back on um, to get or LAX and then you would fly into Maui. I would work my week and then I would fly back in enough time for my next shift, 24 hour shift. We used to work a week on a week off at the time. Um, and I would come back and work. And I did this for a better part of half a year. I remember, I don't think I ever made it out to Lahaina, but I was in Waluku because that's where Maui General was. And I stayed um, in a, what the beginning of the Airbnb um, at one of the resorts um, out at the whale watching res uh, reserve. And everyone would pull over. I remember going back home and everybody would pull off the side of the road just to watch sunsets because they were so beautiful at that time. And I'll probably put um, some of the pictures again in the extended podcast notes, but I never would have thought that that paradise, the road to Hilo and all of those things, how can you actually have wildfires in a rainforest? What is the setup and who is mismanaging the forest in, because that is the draw to that area. You know what I mean? We got the death count is up to 80. And there are a thousand people that are missing. The housing crisis has, is just that. There is so many people, and it's so expensive, that mo a lot of people, not everybody can have houses like Oprah, but they do take up a lot of room. The average person doesn't, can't really afford to live there. So they're packed like sardines into these tinder boxes, literally. And it's really sad that people were jumping and drowning in the sea trying to run away from the fires. They had an opt-in uh, alarm system, no smoke detectors, no central uh, sprinkler systems, because again, Hawaii is technically a rainforest. Maui technically is a rainforest, but there ain't no damn rain. It's just so sad. Even, I don't remember if people remember on the big island when the volcano erupted a few years ago and neighborhoods and people that actually lost their lives with that. This is probably more so than that because the uh, electric, um, they didn't cut power. So a lot of this was promulgated by the electric uh, uh, cooperative there. The whole thing just is sad. And I think what I remember of being on the island and the prices that I'm paying now that you can actually pay now before I got my lettuce grow is what I was paying for mixed greens at the one Whole Foods on the island. I thought it was tripped out that I was paying six or seven dollars for just a box ten of lettuce. Now it's up to eight, paying as much as eight dollars for some blue um, eggs that supposedly are organic or cage free. And those prices were where the regular conventional white eggs started in um, Maui now. Prices are is expensive and now all of it's all burn up because of mismanagement. And of course, if you listen to the Republican racist, there's no such thing as global warming, but this is how global warming can burn up a rainforest. So how about that? Also, there's more, there hasn't been much more movement on the Lizzo accusation of uh, sexual misconduct. What is being propagated in the popular press is, oh, she's not nice and she fat shamed. 
okay, so what? I don't think anyone would fault most people like Ella DeGeneres. Oh, she's really not nice. Okay. Oh, she fat shame other people, even though that's the least of the severity of what she's accused of. It's the sexual misconduct that is most concerning in those cases and the accusations. I don't give a crap if she was not nice because I know I'm stank on my best day. But what I would be more and what we should be focused on is what, if they're saying what she is, did or forced these women and men and them to do, that should be the focus. So there you go. And who's stunting and fronting in the unreality of this? I just, stunting, grunting, and no, they ain't got nothing. Evidently, Marcel um, Holt from Love and Marriage Huntsville actually asked broke ass Sheree Whitfield, my favorite, Sherry White, to cash up him some money. Because if you follow uh, Love and Marriage Huntsville, you know that the house that he was living in is being sold. He was renting it from friends of friends, um, but they actually sold the property, not to him, because evidently his credit, it must be bad, and he ain't got no money. So, and as he's not the only one, that other pig, Marceau, is also broke. He rolling around in a Ferrari with gold wings. He kind of broke it, he broke. And as well as, I think her name is Stormy. I didn't know that she, there's some accusations flo uh, floating around about her contaminated beauty products. And she actually has, there's a lawsuit that is pending um, that, that hasn't been settled yet. There's a whole bunch of people out here evidently stunting and grunting and know they ain't got nothing. And that whole franchise seemed to have a whole bunch of stunners. And I'm wondering, also, I'm having some difficulties getting into the whiny men that are a part of the Love and Marriage Detroit crew. I don't know. It's just that uh, there's a bunch of stunt people and in the big D, they're known for scams. So I'm wondering who's the next to fall. Just saying. Just saying. The Shade Bunch. The Shade Bunch. I hope turning up for checks to pay for fake lifestyles were to be a part of the Shady Bunch. So I apologize for not using my microphone to record this, but I'm sitting here watching season 10 of Real Housewives of Atlanta because I will, I can't rewatch season 15 because it's almost not watchable. Even the after show is stupid. But anyways, I'm watching how... Nene basically twists back the focus of the other characters back to her. I'm not sure if this is just a manipulative, uh, narcissistic way for her to make sure she controls the different scenes or the narrative of the show. But how did she or why did she downplay the lie that Phaedra and uh, Portia told? That was massive, completely massive. And it was like she manip tried to manipulate the narrative to get it back to her to pump up her storyline. I'm just saying that's this is just an observation because I've watched this like, what, 20 times. However, I also didn't understand why Kenya, even though she got married in secret, why didn't she renew her vows once they started recording again? Because her planning for her marriage in either New York, Texas, 
or Atlanta would have been big. And why was she so scared? Because she would have made a beautiful bride. And it would have been just great. And then she could have went on another honeymoon and it would all have been comped by the network. Why did she never remarry Mark Daly? Or was the foundation of her marriage already on shaky grounds? Because he wasn't with the shits. He hated that she participated in the show. He also, until he actually, it's the rumor that he has this, He's coming up for his own reality show that he resented her participation in the show because and he looked down on it and he told her that over and over again. I'm sure he probably told her some bullshit that you're not a real star. You're not all that pretty, Uh, blah, 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 more uh, Kenya Moore hair care is not all that great when in fact she is a brand her hair care company, beauty company, was doing by leaps and bounds, and she was outshining him. She did probably did not want to risk asking for him to renew her vows on TV because she did not want to risk it because she knew how her marriage was already on shaky ground. But that would have been a great storyline that could have not only carried her through this season, but the next. And she could have been the star that she was always meant to be, but it was a lost chance. Now we don't care. We just want her to go ahead and divorce his dumb ass, his square box. Did you see him walking like, oh, like I got a stick up my ass and I got bad feet. I can't, could never stand Mark Daly. He was like one of those men that's pretty on paper, but he's such an asshole every time they talk. That's what I always saw him as. And it's so sad. Someone like Kenya Moore, Miss USA, 1993. The mother of the cutest kid on the planet, Brooklyn, uh, was married and she thought she had to be married to this jackass. And there was no way it was ever going to work because I think she compromised a lot to to get this guy. And for what? He had, what, one restaurant? And then that blew up after the pan, pandemic Pro-V. Whatever. Feel bad for her. But I think I answered my own question. The reason why she didn't remarry him is because he would have blew that up just to get back at her. He would blow up his nose even with that nose ring, despite his face. So I'm over several things. I think I'm just like most fans of Real Housewives of Atlanta. Last week's episode, again, what is it, 0.27? It's just ridiculous. Less than 700,000 people watched last week's. I have a feeling if it's not the same for this week, it's going to be even lower it's just like production is given up. There is all the scenes seem to be contrived and it was no connection. There was no flair. I was, I was excited because Cynthia Bailey was back and then they even had a new and improved Shamia back, which made me think that, oh, are they going to bring Portia back? No. They wasted my time and it does, there was no real connection. I was also happy that I thought I was going to see some realness when, because I had already heard about there was a couple's kind of mental health retreat, but I knew anything that had to do with Drew Sador was going to be produced and it was going to be stupid and it was going to only be surface. Drew made no in preseason, Drew made no um, excuses that her sister had significant mental health issues and Ralph had bullied her into cutting ties, but they didn't really deal with that. She basically said, oh yeah, my sister, when she went through her divorce, she, you know, she had her significant mental health break but 
the everything that they did at this beautiful house was so surface. I was looking at them like, okay, they I bet they were up in Blue Ridge in this that same house similar, or was it one of Tyler Perry's houses or mansions? And they didn't even touch on the significance of what that woman had gone through. PTSD, abuse, and she literally had a mental health break. And how she was banned from coming to their home. That was Ralph. And he came, showed up, hugged everybody else, and she had to chase him down. I knew it was going to be surface, and I knew it was going to be dumb. It was going to be so ridiculous. This season still continues to not make sense, and I'm so annoyed that I was awake for it. When I saw Brooklyn play fighting with her mom in the beginning, and she was just such a sweet, she is such a sweet, adorable little kid. I even have the YouTube link where she basically just is such a sweet and look, looking like her daddy, but just over the top sweet and how she loved her mom just because she was her mom. And it was just so obvious that she's just a wonderful kid. I am such a Brooklyn Daily stan. Her mama is sketch though. She kind of is a mean girl. She be like spinning it and she be just, oh, she will go toe to toe with you. She, Kenya Moore is reality TV gold because she can turn it on and be just mean and capture the camera with those green eyes. She's, she looks, she has her father's eyes. I get why she won Miss USA. I get it, but she is evil, but she is such an adorable little kid. I wanted to see more of that because that was realness. It was just so cute. It's like a, a, a basket of puppies when you watch them interact and watch that little girl talk because she's so adorable. But this other contrived crap makes me mad that, again, I stayed awake to watch it. But I couldn't fall asleep because I didn't take my Motrin PM. I'm getting ready to take my Motrin PM and just be extremely annoyed. I don't know what's going on with Sheree and them. That whole setup where her man is just ridiculous. I don't understand, with the exception of Candy and um, Todd and Sonya, even that storyline falls flat. There's really no anchor and there's really no one on the show again this season that makes you want to really stay up in the days of old. I'm still re-watching I'm up to, what season is this I'm up to? This is um, season 11, the great, late, great Greg Leakes when he is um, diagnosed with really advanced colon cancer. I would rather watch this. And I'm get, I'm thinking about re-watching season nine where old phony Fei Fei gets caught out in a megawatt lie. I would rather watch that then watch any of this BS on 15. Again, they have ratings that will get you canceled. Either they're going to cancel this show or they're going to need to reboot it because this cast that they have on now doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. I have such great hopes that the Shamia, but Shamia by herself doesn't make sense without Portia and her old uh, Hamanamanama sister, her crunchy sister and her old, her mom who continues to look younger than, you know, Portia. But I want to see that. I want to see her two story teeth and her massive weave. I want to see that. I even want to see Eva come back. I don't want to see phony Fei Fei because I think her, Scorpio maniacalness, it doesn't make to any sense. It only would make sense if they bring her back with Apollo 
his scamming ass and Shireen, his current girlfriend. Now that would be crazy. If she come now, if Phaedra comes back with her new man and she's willing to, I don't know if she's still practicing, but if she's willing to film that and Apollo is willing to come back and Peter comes back, oh yes, I would want to see that show. That would be some gangster-ish. And then since that would make sense if Cynthia's back with Peter. Because Mike Hill, he was nice, but he won't Peter Thomas, y'all. And then Portia comes back. Her man was cool because he was like, okay, she's great, but I'm good. I'll just stay in our mansion and just hold her down. I don't, but I really don't want to see Kim Zosiak Beerman back because I did watch like season 10 and I, it didn't make sense. Her show has since been canceled. Her and Croy have since filed for divorce, probably for my financial reasons. I'm okay with it, her not coming back because on she's I think she's low key racist. She says says she stuff like colorblind. She doesn't see because she's just so privileged that and she is such a racist. That's what racists say, and she was just so problematic. And Sheree doesn't make sense with her face like her, but they she's turned in to Kim Zosiak with the wigs and the fillers. Just saying. And if I hear anything about Martell's broke ass, I'm, 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 I'm going to explode. It does not make sense. Nobody is an anchor on this show. They're just showing up for a check. We're not getting Real Housewife realness. I'm tired. They really need to reboot or bring back everybody that really makes sense or people that are actually friends because the bitches that are on this show right now aren't doing it for me. And even with Candy, if she would show some of the interactions like Kenya with her daughter, and I now I understand. I had a whole previous segment about why isn't Kenya divorced yet? Because Mark Daly, he understands just like Apollo did. He could potentially be her storyline, but Kenya ain't crazy. She doesn't want to mention him because she doesn't want to have to give him any scratch from her games that he basically uh, ran down right probably within the first six months of them being married. Why she got, she he basically said he was disappointed. He didn't approve of the show, blah, 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 blah. Didn't come with her um, on the, didn't allow the filming, didn't come to the first reunion after they got married refused to be filmed, walked off the set with his old straight ass head. And now he wants his part. He thinks he needs to get some of the scratch. That what that shows you that you need, just like Mother Joyce, even though I think she's a horrible person. Sorry, Candy. But if you don't get a prenup and you don't have the verbiage uh to the manner which I am used to. And Ashley uh, will tell you this from Potomac. They can get you for a scratch. You either can, you can mess up your bag or they can come back and try to get part of your hard earned money. She did all that stuff for him, bent over backwards, tried to be wifey, became somebody else. And then he wants a piece of the pie, even though he ran the show down. Boy, bye. He needs to sign the papers and keep it pushing. I think he's a punk. And we all, I think we all agreed that he was a punk. The way he was treating her. And he just wasn't. And his demands, even at the beginning, and what she had to put up with. And she wants to have, and now the storyline is, she is trying to get a surrogate to have the rest of their embryos always be tied to him. I wonder, but it sounds like she may have the custody worked out. But if she could possibly have another sweet, this is Kenya Moore, y'all, another sweet kid, very much like Brooklyn, 
okay, I'll be cool with that. But she, her OB told her it would kill her. Once Shadina, her uterus cools down or someone like her, I can see that. I think we, the world needs more of Brooklyn Daily. If she could have two more clones of that little girl, that would be golden. I would be all here for it. She's a beaut- She's always been, she was a beautiful toddler. She's a beautiful kid. I'm here for it. I'm Gucci. I'm golden. But that fool needs to give up the goat and keep it pushing. Because he doesn't deserve. It is so wild that they have such a beautiful kid. He doesn't deserve to interact with a cute kid like that. And I'm wondering if Candy's kids are just as sweet. I suspected, because I've seen some of the clips of little uh, Blaze, and I went to her restaurant, the food was good. Um, I'm not sure about Ace. He started out really cute, waking up, smiling, and pooping on the pot. He was like three, four months old. That was funny. But I don't know. I think he had separation anxiety that they never actually got. Um, He really never got over. And he also is kind of funny looking now. He is more, I don't know who he looks like. He's really thin and got that long head. (laughs) Like Candy and them said, he long faced it. Also, I've been fussing about Real Housewives of Atlanta. Real Housewives of New York, I'm going to have to rewatch it. But this this Jessel chick, I'm not so sure about her. I'm reminded about her and Aaron's interaction. Everybody hated the second Sex and the City movie. But there was a part where Miranda and um, Charlotte were having a drink. And Charlotte had to admit that Rose and Lily were awful. And she basically used to hide in the pantry. And they were like, drink. And basically, Miranda, which I think is actually kind of funny, because Miranda, um, I think, didn't Lily screw Miranda's kid? (laughs) But that interaction that they had, which was just really weird, that Jessel has no idea how she's coming off as the classist bitch. And they are looking at her like Cy and Aaron are looking at her like she doesn't know that Tribeca is the it neighborhood. It's one of the ex- most expensive real estate in the world. And she says, oh, it's up and coming. No, it ain't, bitch. It's up and came. It has been here. And for you... You know you knew money because you don't know that. And she literally doesn't care. I don't know if it's baby brain or she's just not getting the D brain because she is just completely clueless as to her classism. I I don't know. And they were, I think, uh, Carlos King and his friend were talking about they don't know about Uba's place. Uba, I think her place is pretty much sealed. Um, she's just going to be that fun girl that is a skinny supermodel. She actually does have a backstory uh, because her Ethiopian roots, um, her cousin that's on <laughs> the Real House of Bye Bye, the Real Housewife of Bye Bye, was it Ezin or whoever her name is, her story is going to continue to come out. And I think she's going, once she gets her groove, I can see her coming back more so than the conservative right-wing leaning Jessel. I think Jessel's personality is going, and the fan are not, people like me can't really vibe with someone like her that is so obviously wrong. I mean, rem- but that whole, that, chick Ramona she's on a level beyond Ramona wrong and doesn't care she's like I know I I'm not going to take ownership of the fact that we I'm not listening to you I'm having a complete different conversation but I'm going to sit in my rightness because I'm skinny I'm pretty and I'm Indian 
and I'm married and I have two kids. I've done everything right. And that's why you should accept me. That to me is so over the top typical of these princesses that are big time money. I don't know if it's real housewife goal, but maybe, but she is not likable. I know I don't like her, but I'm still leaning into the Aaron um, uh, friends. What's her name? Rachel of it all. She, Cause she really is given that Rachel vibe. Uh, old money, old New York. Um, but it's just not, she doesn't have that middle-class guilt. She has her own, she has old Jewish money and, but she knows and she accepts it. She knows she got it and, and she's classy, but she doesn't get people like Jessel. Um, and the more I learn about Bryn's backstory, it's very tragic and her being, you know, the chess champion because she couldn't afford other things and she looks a million bucks, but she obviously is so hurt and she's just fine. And she chooses, she had to choose to be happy because her reality was so grim. And I think that's why they respect that her so much. That's why side vibes with her, Uber vibes with her. Jessel doesn't understand her because she's so self-centered and she's been so privileged. She can't understand anybody growing up like that and still being beautiful and having a beautiful spirit like Bryn. And that's where the, the, the problem lies with Jessel. I don't understand how Jenna's going to fit into it all. She seems to be on the outskirts and just vibing um, and still reconciling her straight life with her lesbian life. I don't know. And there may be a story there, but it may not be enough to keep her on the store. She's brilliant, but I don't know if the old worn jeans are going to keep her on this show. I'm just saying. How can you connect with someone that is so on the outskirts and only are willing to be an observer, but not allow you to observe her real life, her journey? And that's it for this episode of Tenfro is Reading. You know, I talked cash-ish all last year. I hope the listening audience will continue to enjoy my opinion and not so subtle shade. I mean, I'm 2,000 listeners per episode in, so go run tell that haters. I may take it on the road if I get hint hint sponsorship. Navigate to dalesangelsinc.blog for swag and extended podcast notes. Don't forget to hit like or leave a five-star review. It gets me on top of the algorithms and it may just get you on my show. 2023's motto is boss up and get the bag. And as always, tell a friend and thank you for listening.